What up? You got Ramon from NotFest.com. We are in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. We're at 1720. And I'm with Spencer of Archspire. You guys are getting ready to decimate this place in just a few hours. I wanted to definitely get into the, the excitement of the tour. I know that you guys started things out on this run, what, four days ago? This is the fourth show of the run. Um, a lot of the shows already were either sold out or had low ticket warnings. Um, what kind of momentum does that give you going into a, a run like this? How does that make you guys feel? That that reception, the ap- the appetite is obviously there. Yeah, it feels great. I think everybody's uh, so starved after COVID, right? So uh, shows are roaring back, and everyone's eager to come and watch a band play and buy merch. And uh, yeah, it's cool. It's it's nice. Two years. It's been a long two years. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's definitely talk about that. Uh, what was what was the first show of this run like? I mean, you guys arguably have your best work to date um hitting that stage playing some of those songs for the first time seeing what the pop was like from the audience Mm. give us a little bit of that experience what did that feel like and how is it compared to tours in the past where i I mean i think we kind of took for granted what that felt like i hate to like beat the whole covid thing to death (laughs) but you know like that's i mean it had to definitely feel at least somewhat different you know honestly it took just maybe like 20 minutes of playing and it just felt like back to normal back in the saddle yeah back in the saddle because we'd we'd been touring for so long for so many years for sure you know and it was like also all these bands we're on tour with we've we've toured with pretty much everybody except for entheos and so we know all these guys and so when we saw them again in seattle when we met up it was just like exactly the same like it was like it just right before we left for COVID, it was exactly the same jump right back into yeah. it very cool so, but it's still a little bit strange walking through a crowd with no mask on i gotta admit a little bit weird and then anytime anyone has a little bit of a cough or something everyone's of course paranoid but <laughs> for sure for sure but. um any ring rust i know that you talked about like you know we we were discussing a little earlier about the physicality that goes into the kind of music that you do. Yeah. Um, some of these songs are clocking in at 350. Oh. I think on this new record, you guys crest 400 beats per minute, correct? Yeah. Talk about the physical rigors that come with having to perform at that proficiency with that sort of technicality every single night. Yeah, The studio is one thing, mm-hmm. but being able to like, you got to be on your shit when you're doing yeah. it live too. Like, Yeah, well, when we, um, we have a tour coming up, uh, we'll normally play for about a month or two. We'll play the full set um, every day, right? So you can sometimes I, I play it twice a day most of the time myself. And then uh, in addition to like you know I'm 39, creeping on 40, so uh, like uh, I concentrate a lot on uh, eating healthy and uh, going to the gym and doing lots of cardio. For sure. And, you know, so yeah. And then another big thing too is like the order of songs. For me, it's really important because. I try to switch between muscle groups for different techniques for hitting these higher speeds, and it's easy to blow one out. For sure. So we like to stagger the songs uh, so that basically I can have many, many little breaks. Lots of the breaks in the songs too are actually strategically there because I told the guys uh, my arms are about to fall off, so <laughs> I need a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so let's yeah. talk a little bit about the live pop that you get from these sorts of songs. Now. I, it's it's something that I've always been interested in, but given the kind of technicality that you guys operate with, the crowd response, does it mean more to you when they sit and actually pay attention to what's going on and observe that sort of, and maybe appreciate that kind of technicality? Or do you just are you just looking for the crowd to kind of give you the same intensity that you're giving them? Like what's a little more rewarding for you in terms of the live translation of what you guys are doing? kind of hard to say there's some parts in the songs that the room always moshes to you always have headbangers and then there's lots of the faster technical stuff where people just want to watch so it's generally actually it's a mix of the two okay at shows we rarely get a show where people just stand there and we rarely get a show where they just mosh impossible to just stand there it's pretty much it's impossible so um no i like them both but to be honest it's pretty hard to see the crowd a lot of the time behind the kit back there with all the lights in your face for sure so sometimes i don't even know if it was a good room i can hear them a little bit but <laughs> i would just hate for some of that some of that talent to go like unappreciated you know what i mean when you're operating at that level of precision right you know i think the musician in you is like you kind of want some of that gratification at least i would think oh, as an observer you know what i mean of, like yeah some of, of the shit you're doing do, is yeah. incredibly <laughs> difficult you know like right uh, I, I just kind of preparing. I was kind of listening to some of the old stuff, and and 
I remember listening to like Cryptopsy, right. you know, and a song like some of that early '90s stuff, yeah. and thinking that's that's incredibly fast that, shit. And then, it is incredibly fast shit. Yeah. And, and then I hear, you know, I hear what you guys are doing at 400 beats per minute. Mm. I can't wrap my head around it, and then I can't wrap my head around how you perform it live, and then you do it nightly, which is yeah. well, insane. There's there's quite a bit of ritual, like uh, stretching, um, obviously hydrating. Um, I can't eat within a three-hour window of playing. Holy shit. Right, because all your blood is in your stomach. It won't go to your limbs. Um, warming up to the, just the perfect amount is key because it's so easy to have anxiety and just overwarm up and then you hit the stage and then all of a sudden your arm starts seizing up. Has that happened? Oh, it's happened many, many times. Holy yeah. shit. <laughs> look, okay, so this is a this is a trial and error sort oh, of. Oh, yeah. That. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, the, the eating one was real was a hard lesson because some shows we would just bomb <laughs> you know the, the guitar players it's not such a big deal but for ollie and i the singer it's a it's a big deal yeah and um i remember somebody suggested well don't eat before you go on stage so we tried two hours and we both noticed a big improvement but we still had some some bad shows okay and then a good friend of mine back home who's a, a big hockey fan he told me that they they feed the canucks before they go on ice three hours before a game so i figured that there was Seems probably like some science spot. behind it there, yeah. For sure. So, so we, we changed it three hours, and then and, and now I just play infinitely better because of it. Very cool. So Let, Let's get into this record here. Okay. Um, Bleed the Future, second time you guys are nominated for a Juno Award, mm-hmm. which stateside, mm. you know, we have the Grammys. Mm-hmm. The Grammys really seem to kind of... Um, how do I politely say this? They almost, <laughs> almost completely think of heavy music as yeah. an afterthought. Sure. Um, I kind of feel like the Juno Awards do a really good job of yeah. acknowledging that space. For sure. Um, yeah. And for you guys to be nominated twice, you know, what what does that sort of uh, that critical reception? How does that sit with you guys? Do you evaluate it all? Is it? Oh, I mean, for sure. you always hear that old adage, you know, like we don't write music for the critics; we write it for the fans. But for sure. I got to imagine, like, on a professional level, to get that mm. kind of acknowledgement, it's got to hold some weight, right? The first time it happened, we were shocked because of how extreme the music is we play. For sure. And um, I don't know. It just sort of made us pretty proud, you know, that, that, that the government will actually acknowledge all artists, not just pop music or, awesome. or just rock bands. Um, and, uh, yeah, we went to the event last time, and it was really fun, and... They, I mean, they do a good job. The Junos are a really positive thing. And it's too bad the Grammys don't recognize extreme music because, I mean, there's so many people in the U.S. who listen to it. You know what I mean? It's an internal debate. It's definitely yeah. one of those things where, uh, you know, you don't want to, like, badmouth anyone at all. Yeah. And, you know, maybe the maybe the aim here is to just kind of prop up how well the Juno Awards do, in fact, do it. Right. You know, just to your point, you know, you guys are doing technical death metal. It's, yeah. It's a very... I know. <laughs> it's, it's very niche. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. at the same time, to be acknowledged not once but twice, yeah. it's got to be gratifying. You know what the main thing is? Uh, because the music is so extreme, sometimes it's hard to explain to parents, right, what the music is. And all of our parents are pretty cool with it. They get it. But their sure. friends are just like, you know, what the hell is that, right? <laughs> getting, being in Canada, you know, getting on the Junos, everybody knows that. For sure. So this gives full legitimacy to our folks to be able to tell their friends that we got nominated for Juno. So so now everybody takes you, all, all those once. parents' friends take you a lot more seriously. But twice, but twice nominated. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> so to me, that was the coolest thing about the Junos was it just... Suddenly, my parents' social group was just like, oh, this is legit. Right. right? So yeah. It legitimizes what you're doing. Exactly. For sure. I get yeah. that. Um, two and a half years to write this album. But mm-hmm. you guys you guys have been very open about the amount of time that you guys invest in putting something together like this. Yeah. Um, again, not to, not to linger on COVID too mm. much, but I got to imagine that that extra time that, that, that afforded you really kind of allowed you to open things up a little bit in terms yeah. of songwriting and yeah we we had a plan i think we were doing australia and we were doing a canadian tour yeah and we were dotting that in between writing and um those tours of course got canned because of covid and sure. um it just freed up all this time and then when we started writing we realized oh that actually worked out better than we thought because we <laughs> we didn't give ourselves enough time to write an album there's no way we would have been happy with it um, this time around, we really concentrated on um, pre-production, so recording it ourselves. Okay. So we would jam out a song, figure out what riffs we like, what we thought flowed into what, and then we would record it. 
and we would put it up on the screen so you could see it. And Ollie would go through and we could actually write vocal patterns based off of the patterns we were seeing, say, from like the snare drum on the screen or what the bass pattern was doing, right? So we start figuring out vocal patterns and then, you know, he would do some and then I'd be like, oh, you're doing this. Well, maybe I could change the snare, snare pattern to match that or something like that. So you right. start seeing all these patterns emerging from the screen. You guys are mad scientists. And, yeah. <laughs> and um, you're, you're hearing this back, right? And it's, yeah. it's you know, it's it's very scientific. That, that Well, I don't know if it's scientific, it, but it's just using the modern tools From the outsider perspective, have. you guys, yeah. you know, it's... It, you guys are wired very differently and it's kind of amazing to see on the out, on the outside just mm. you know like you're wired mm. in a completely different way it's cool to see it is yeah it was, it was it was a good experience by the time we actually got to record with otero it was like our third time doing the album because Jeez. we just kept re-recording it and listening to it and changing our ideas and blah 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 and then once you get to otero he brings his own ideas in and it's nice having a fresh pair of ears uh somebody who's not playing an instrument Right. Because especially if it's like a technique you really like or it was your idea, you know, people might have emotional attachments to stuff and for not sure. want to can it, which is sometimes not best for, for the song. Well, know? and let's get to that. Like having that extra time, did you guys run into any instance where you're maybe like piecing it apart too much, where you're overthinking it? You know, there is there's something to be said for having that deadline where it's like we got to get this and we got to move on it quickly. Mm. I understand having that extra time. But did you guys find yourself where it was just like you were way too involved in it and like you couldn't see the forest for the trees sort of situation? Yeah, that always happens. Yeah. yeah. We when we wrote the last album, we did like a Monday to Friday sort of thing. We'd get together in the jam spot and write. Scheduled, yeah. And, and we found it was just so frustrating because you just get so bogged down on minor little details. And yeah, it would take away your ability to see the big picture. And so we changed it this time to jamming, I think, I believe it was three days a week with the recordings. And then, you know, you'd go home and you would listen to what you had recorded and you'd have some time to absorb it. Another trick, too, was like uh, I would send some of the ideas to my friends to listen to. Like, what do you think of this? You know, or my parents. I'd send it to my mom. You outside know? perspective yeah for sure you know, and they were always giving their honest opinion and that helped shape a lot of that it's great that you have a core team around you that for gives sure. you your honest opinion as opposed oh, yeah. to oh it's great you know? yeah 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 but uh, yeah i read something where where dean was talking about um the band kind of sets like a like a 10 percent metric of increasing their their skill set like mm -hmm. i'm probably mangling that but <laughs> you know he, he he talked about setting setting the bar about 10 percent higher yeah. than where you guys are currently in terms of how you guys progress as a band yes are you getting to the point where you're going to top out here soon because <laughs> i like yeah. i you know yeah. the last record i think you guys crest 350 beats per minute mm. On Bleed the Future, you guys hit 400 beats per minute. Mm. Where in the fuck do you top out? Because you're know. also humans, yeah, at least from what I understand. We're not getting like, any younger, too. Yeah. yeah, it's. I mean, you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier as far as the touring rigors, but you know, there's an authenticity in what you guys do in the studio too, mm. and and that really is at the core of, of of your sound. Yeah. But at some point, I mean, there's there's got to be a ceiling, right? Like. Yeah. Um, you know it. I didn't, I didn't really know what it would be for um, the last album, and it was sort of just when we were writing, something just came to us. You know, we figured out a way to pump the tempos up. For sure. And then when we started writing the next album, the same thing happened. It was just like something sort of just stumbled upon another technique that allowed me to play even faster again. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's so physical. It's so exhausting. Uh, juggling it live is becoming increasingly more difficult. I'm gonna tell you right now, as yeah. a listener, yeah, it's exhausting. Yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, it's it, like you start thinking about it in terms of like some there's there's a human being actually doing this mm -hmm. that's putting this together. Yeah, as opposed to like I mean, it's not a drum machine. This is all live. You well, know, like I was saying, the order of the songs is important. Yeah, the amount of rest time in between the songs. So like we've done it a million times and we fine-tuned it so I could figure out when I had enough blood back in my forearms to play again and um, And still sometimes we get the formula wrong, you know, like yesterday I probably didn't drink enough water and I felt like my arms were starting to seize up a little bit Ooh. You know, so it's just like you're always walking this very fine line and for sure trying to hit that sweet spot and after a certain amount of time, you start hitting more often than not, but you still have off nights, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I would imagine yeah. so. And yeah. I'm but no one seems to notice, to be honest. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Like, Because they can't do it. That's that's just so. the truth, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, 
as far as what the future looks like for you guys, mm -hmm. obviously you're going to be touring on Bleed the Future for the remainder of the year. Yeah. I know that you guys are going to be doing the Faces of Death tour with Rivers, right? In Later Europe. on this year, you guys do that in yep. Europe. Yep. Um, you guys got your headliner here. Yep. Um, uh, we have another big tour in another part of the world. It's not been announced yet between now. So I can't say anything, but... Uh, we'll watch for that. Yeah. We'll obviously keep an eye. Yeah. Um, as far as where you guys feel that Bleed the Future ranks, mm. in terms of personally, mm. I mean, obviously your newest record is going to be your best or what you feel is your best foot forward. Yeah. Um, but as far as how the band has progressed, mm. the evolution of your sound, the development of different techniques that allow you to kind of push that envelope. Right. How rewarding has this record been for you guys, given... It was kind of a scary time to release music. Yeah. Um, music was very uncertain in terms yeah. of like the live aspect of it all. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, have, I mean, we're, it's 4.30 outside right now, Pacific time, and you got to line around the building yeah. waiting for this to get started. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, it's got to feel great. Right? It feels awesome, man. Yeah, it feels awesome. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this is everybody's favorite album. Um, you know, we sort of always had this mentality of, you can't be good at everything, so take what you're good at and just try to expand on it. For sure. So um, we spent a lot of time talking about what we think makes us unique and then tried to do more of that. And um, we also wanted to, I mean, we love, of course, technical music, but we we also wanted to put a lot of importance on like uh, memorable parts and earworms, as the Germans call it. Um, just catchy stuff, hooks, yeah, you know, and also from touring live so much, we've, we've got a, a pretty good idea of what the crowd responds to, right? Because they want to, they want to mosh, they want a headbang for sure. So we started writing in more parts for that live experience as well, too, more heavy headbanging shit. There's, it feels like you guys uh, kind of got a wrangle on how best to kind of pull your punches. Yeah. So I mean, if if you're constantly beating the shit out of somebody versus landing that haymaker, yeah, it seems like a much more effective way. Yeah, it gives the, the music more dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. it gives you the, probably those. And mid, it gives me a break. Those mid song breaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Archspire is getting ready to perform right here at 1720. They'll be out on tour for the remainder of April in through May. There's some unannounced tours coming up, and they'll also be hitting Europe later on this year. Pick up the album. It's on Season of Mist. Bleed the Future. Spencer, dude, thank you so much, man. Thank you.